Good day to everyone. First of all, thank you very much for joining us for today's session. This is basically our first trial class for ICAAW. We are talking about ICAAW and in ICAAW, particularly we are discussing advanced level. I hope that you people have joined my orientation. If any one of you who have missed my orientation, the link of orientation will be shared with you people. In this session, in advanced level, we are going to discuss one of the most important exam of ICAW. Obviously, all exams are most are important, but in this session, we are going to discuss about corporate reporting. Corporate reporting or corporate reporting is normally known as CI in short form. So in this session, we will discuss about corporate reporting. Particularly, we will discuss the syllabus of corporate reporting, like what you have to study, how you have to study, at which level you have to study your reporting element. So let's start without any delay. Whenever you have to study, particularly for ICAAW or any other professional qualification, so please try to make sure that you are using your latest study material, you are using your latest syllabus notes, each and everything basically. Why? The reason is that basically, let's say, if someone of you is using the old study material, then you people may not have an idea what changes are there. So unfortunately, you might pick up the wrong point in your exam and that could be something unfavorable. So please try to use your latest syllabus, latest notes, each and everything that should be updated. So what we have done, so this is a syllabus of corporate reporting and this is for exams in 2022. So it means that syllabus will be used in your 2022 exams basically. The copy of this syllabus will be shared to you after the session. Obviously, there will be the contents. What contents do we have to cover? First of all, the examiner discuss about what skills you require to pass your corporate reporting exam. Then we will discuss the syllabus, particularly syllabus of ICAW advanced level corporate reporting. As we know, as we have discussed in our orientation that corporate reporting or CR is primarily composed of two major elements. First of all, reporting element. And second, it is the audit element. And we have discussed in too much detail in our orientation. Obviously, it involves the ethics element too, but it is approximately 5 to 10%. But major, we have to study our reporting and audit elements in this area. So we will discuss which reporting standards, either they are the IAS, either they are IFRS, or any other standard, what we have to study for our corporate reporting exam. We will also discuss which auditing standards do we need to study in this corporate reporting exam as well, basically. Again, that's an overview of your ACA qualification. Component of your ACA qualification, like for example, if you want to be a member, then what you need to do, you need to complete your exam, you need to complete your training, your module, each and everything. But major part of this discussion is basically how we have to go for corporate reporting exam. As I was talking with you earlier that corporate reporting is basically a first exam of ICAAW advanced level. Two other exams are basically strategic business management, SBM, and last exam is basically the case study. So after the class of corporate reporting, we will be having a trial class for SBM or strategic business management. So let's move on. First of all, we will be talking about the standards, which areas do we need to cover? And then we will discuss which skills you must possess to pass your corporate reporting exam, basically. The 
before we move on to different standards what we have to cover first of all you should be able you should understand what are these level there are basically four levels in ICA AW advanced level level D level C level B and level A as well what do you mean by this level these levels mean at which level how much understanding we should be having with one particular standard either it is IES, IFRS, audit or whatever to which extent to what extent do we need to cover a particular topic for example there is a topic IFRS 4 there is a topic IFRS 6 there is another topic IFRS 15 let's say we have these we have these three standards. So what do you think? At which level, at which extent do you need to cover IFRS 15, IFRS 4, IFRS 6, and so on? So ICAW has made it very, very clear in their documents at what level do you need to cover your particular standard, basically. So you should be able to understand what is required from you and how particular topic will be examined with you in your real exam. That's why we have these four different levels. Let's start with level D. Level D, what do you mean by level D? Level D means that is in just an awareness of scope of this standard. It means why we are going to study this standard. What is the scope? Which areas, which item do fall in these standards and which do not? Just you need to go for the awareness Examiner will not discuss technical areas, technical aspects, complex calculation, disclosures. No, it is not required at this D level, basically. Second level, that is level C. Level C means that is a general knowledge with a basic understanding of subject matter. Again, little bit advanced level knowledge, little bit general knowledge as compared to D level that is called as C level. So it means you should be able to identify the significant issues. You should be able to identify the major issues and major problem that is C level. If we talk about level B, level B again, that is a third level. Again, that is going to be a complex level. In level B, you need to be a good working knowledge with a broad understanding of subject matter. Just look at the differences. In level C, you need basic understanding. In level B, you need broad understanding. It means a wider understanding will be required in level B basically. Apart from understanding, you need a good level of experience about its application. That is your level B. And last, that is level A. Level A means you should be having a solid understanding of your subject matter and experience in application of these standards, basically. That is called as level A. So if we just summarize what we have discussed, it means level D is a very, very easy level. Level C is a little bit complex. Level B is a much more complex level. And finally, level A is the highest level of complexity. It means any standard, either it is IES, IFRS, or auditing area. If it is at level A, then detailed knowledge, experience, understanding, judgment is required for that standard. You should be able to go for complex calculation, disclosure, measurement, recognition rules, redefinition rule, each and everything is required for any standard, any area that is at level A, basically. The reason is why I am discussing all of these areas, because as I was just talking earlier, when we will be studying a different topic, so we will devote our time according to their importance. For example, if someone says you have to spend two days on IFRS 4 or IFRS 6, it does not seem to be a good strategy. Why? Because IFRS 6, IFRS 4 is not at level A or level B. So why you need to spend too much amount of time? So you should be careful how questions are going to be examined with you in your real exam, basically. So you have to be careful and you have to move in this particular area.
this is for assurance and audit but first of all we will go for reporting side and then we will come back to our auditing area yes this is financial reporting it is mentioned the IFRS standard but it includes both IES and IFRS as well basically so it means we will study both IES and IFRS in this portion we have three different levels in ICAW, certificate level, professional level, and advanced level. But at this moment, as I discussed, we are just talking about, we are just considering the advanced level because we are not considering the certificate and professional level. We will be having a separate session for those areas. You can see three different columns, accounting, that is particularly a subject of certificate level, financial accounting and reporting, that belongs with your professional level corporate reporting that belongs with your advanced level and that is a point of discussion at this moment so we will start our first point that is international financial reporting standard that is basically the introduction obviously that is at level a now i hope that you people will be having an idea what do we mean by different alphabets a b c and d it means you should be able to explain you should be having a very good understanding how your ies and ifrs are being developed how they are being processed what is the mechanism of ies and ifrs what is your frc financial reporting concept what is ies what were previous ies is just having a brief introduction then again, we have a very, very important point that is conceptual framework for financial reporting. What is conceptual framework? We will discuss different definitions, different concepts. I hope that you people have covered those areas in your very basic areas, in your very basic subjects of accounting and financial accounting or financial reporting or any other subject, but you should be able to revise those conceptual framework. Let's say it is quite possible in your exam, you might have to apply the criteria for any asset. You might have to apply the criteria of liabilities or any other component or any other element. So you should understand what do you mean by asset? What is the criteria? What is the definition of an asset? What is the definition of a liability or liabilities basically? Then again, our financial statements are not complete until or unless we study, we apply IAS1, presentation of financial statements, basically. That is at A level, how you are going to structure your statement of financial position, statement of profit and loss and comprehensive income, cash flow statement, changes in equity, notes to the financial statement, so for every particular element, we have a format and we have to apply that particular format as well. Then we have IES2 inventories. Normally people talk about when we talk about inventories, then people say inventories are measured, inventories are recorded at lower of cost or NRV and then say, thank you very much. No, it is not just lower of cost or NRV you need to understand what do you mean by inventory either this inventory will be classified in ies2 or this inventory will be classified in any other standard it's quite possible your inventory might be classified in any other standard as well just let me give you the example let's say ias2 that is for inventories ias16 that is property plan and equipment ias40 that is for investment properties we have ifrs5 that is for non-current assets held for sale so all of these standards are for NCA, NCA means non-current assets here as well. Let's say your company is being involved 
in sale and purchase of property property now what you are doing you have a business what you do you purchase different properties and then after some time you sell out those properties basically so it means what you are doing you are buying different item and you are selling them it means your main intention is to sell your property so your main business is for resale resale is your main area so anything any item that is for resale purposes it is classified in ias2 inventories basically but let's say we take another example you have property but you think you have to go for different areas now what you have to do you have to develop it into a investment area obviously ias 40 according to ias 40 what we have to do we have to use this property either for rental purposes or for capital appreciation so these could be two different objectives in our mind. Property is same, but now our intention is being changed. If our intention is being changed, then it means what we are going to do. So in this case, IAS2 will not be applied. In this case, IAS16 will not be applied. IAS40 investment properties will be applied. Just see, you have the same property. You have same property but your intention is different. If intention is different, obviously it's accounting treatment, it's financial reporting treatment is going to be the different. Same is the case, if you apply the criteria for IFRS 5 and IAS 16, basically. So you should not assume, because earlier we normally study if it is a property, it could be IAS 16 or IAS 40, no. It could be IAS2, it could be IFRS5, it could be any other standard. So you have to be careful because we are talking about the advanced level and at this advanced level, examiner discuss very technical points basically. We will be having a question. It's quite possible your property might be according to IAS2 at start of the year. After six months, there might be IAS40 at year end your property might be classified from IES 40 to IES 16. So there should be a reclassification if criteria changes. So you have to be very, very careful. Then we have another standard and this standard is basically IES 7, that is statement of cash flows basically. Like how you have to prepare your cash flow statement. I hope that you people will be having an idea. What do we mean by cash flow statement? But we should revise our basics, basically how our cash flow statement is prepared. Apart from its preparation, what we need to do, we need to make comments. How we can use this cash flow statement, basically. What do we mean? We have to analyze this cash flow statement. We will be given a cash flow statement and what we need to do, we need to apply our different criteria. We need to discuss this cash flow. We need to calculate different ratios of cash flow statement in cash from cash flow statement. So you should be able to understand in a very technical level, what do we mean by each component? Let's say examiner will give you the cash flow statement and then examiner will make a statement. You have to analyze the cash flow statement, discuss what are the implications, how cash is being generated. So you have to calculate different ratios, different components, make different comments because at this level, examiner assumes you are going to be a chartered accountant. So after this exam, you will qualify. After ICW exams, you will qualify as an ACA chartered accountant. So definitely at ACA level, examiner assumes, examiner expects something technical, something worth mentioning, like comments, analyze, discussion. As we know, 
that in modern days we are using latest software erp sap oracle or any other software whatever you are using so you just need to go for your different entries different transactions then all of your financial statements are prepared most of the time from your software basically so what is the importance of chartered accountant obviously you have to analyze you have to discuss you have to make comments because a computer a software cannot analyze in much detail as compared to a chartered accountant softwares can calculate but they cannot analyze they cannot predict as compared to a chartered accountant now moving forward we have another standard and this standard is basically iasa accounting policies changes in accounting estimates and errors basically what do you mean by a policy what is estimate and what is error so you should be able to differentiate between these three components policy estimate and error if there is an error in your financial statements then what you need to do how this error could be rectified how this error could be corrected let's say if this error is from last 20 years then what you need to do obviously you might not have the data you might not have records for last 20 years who goes for 20 years record obviously no one so what you need to do definitely we will discuss in our complete area of ias state basically then we have another important standard that is ias and events after the reporting period let's say if we have a reporting period then what do you mean by reporting first of all you, we will discuss what is reporting period how we will define the reporting period then what will happen if there are some transactions who are going to affect your business if there are some events that are going to affect your business so how we have to record either we have to record those transaction those events or we should not go for those areas basically that is your iasn events after the reporting period then we have another standard that is called as ias12 income taxes what is income tax in income tax is basically we will talk about the income tax yes you people will be familiar with the idea of income tax but primarily we will discuss what is deferred tax basically what is different between difference between income tax and deferred tax again deferred tax is of different type like deferred tax it could be due to permanent differences it could be due to temporary differences what you need to do what is permanent difference what is temporary difference how we have to record them can deferred tax differences be removed or they cannot be removed basically we will discuss deferred tax implication on business acquisition business acquisition in short what that is consolidation what is deferred tax implication on your ias 19 employee benefit what are deferred tax implication on your ifrs 2 share based payments basically and many in the standards basically so deferred tax will not be discussed in simple term deferred tax will be discussed at complex business transactions of consolidation business acquisition is 19 employee benefits ifrs2 share based payments and many in that area specific then we have one of the very famous standard that is called as is 16 property plant and equipment what is property plant equipment what is the criteria what is its recognition de recognition disclosure what are complex assets so we will discuss what is a complex asset how we have to record what is the accounting treatment of this complex asset what about depreciation how depreciation is recorded for complex asset what about revaluation normally we talk about the revaluation and we hear this word again and again that revaluation should be conducted should be performed on regular basis so i am just taking a pause
for a minute just understand just tell me what do you mean by regular basis in revaluation what do you mean by regular basis Just try to participate. It doesn't matter either you are right, you are wrong, because what is my style, how we discuss, I believe that we have interactive session and all of my previous sessions were interactive session basically. If I give you hint, then regular basis means like it could be one year, two year, three year, five year, 10 year, what, or six months. What is regular basis? Normally, people say that regular basis means like two years or five years or every year. No, the regular basis does not mean every year. For example, if this is, there is an SME, small and medium sized entity, and if this rule of free valuation applies on SME, then it means for that SME, you need to go for revaluation every year. Let's say in 2020, the value of your property, let's say, here we have a property. Property value was 100,000. Let's say in 2021, your property value is, let's say, 105,000. So it means your property value has increased by 5,000. But it's quite possible the revaluation firm. The revaluation firm might charge you let's say 10,000 as in their fee. So revaluation gain, revaluation benefit is of 5,000, but we have a fee that is of revaluation firm that is 10,000. So it means ultimately we are in a loss situation of 5,000. So what is the solution? So that's why Regular basis does not mean every year. You need to apply your estimate. You need to assess. You need to review different assumptions. You need to talk about, you need to discuss different industry practices. What are acceptable practices, basically. Then you will go for revaluation, basically. So again, we will discuss in much detail in our complete lecture because this is just an overview of syllabus. So I just highlight some of the technical points, basically. So we will discuss in much detail about regular basis. Obviously, what about for large entities, public limited companies, and so on. Then we have another area that is IAS 19, employee benefits. Yes, we have employed. Every company have employed. So that companies give different type of benefits. For example, there could be share option. There could be pension. There could be leaves, leaves could be short term leaves, long term leaves and so on. Pension leaves, these type of benefits do fall in IAS 19 employee benefits basically. Share option, again, this is also a benefit, but share option is discussed. It will be discussed in IFRS 2, share based payments. We have a separate standard for share option. So we will discuss what is employee benefit? For example, if you go for different types of leave, then what will be the accounting treatment? How it will be recorded? If you go for pension, then how pension is formulated? How your pension is invested? How company deducts your pension basically? How your deduction is used? How company contributes towards your pension scheme? 
how pension scheme is formulated, how many types do we have for pensioning. All of these points will be discussed in IES 90. Then we have IES 20. Normally it is known as government grants basically. But actually you must understand what is government grant? What is government assistant? Do you think is there any difference between grant and assistant? Yes. Why? Examiner has used the word and government grant and government assistant. If government grant and assistant could have same thing, then examiner would not have used this and sign. Definitely then it would be grant and then assist. It means these are the same thing. No, but we have used technical differences in terms of definition. We have a lot of differences in terms of accounting treatment of a government grant and a government assistant basically. For a common person, both of these words could be same, but as we are going through started accountancy exam, so we must able to understand, we must differentiate what is grant and what is assistance basically. Then we have another area that is IES 21, the effects of changes in foreign exchange rates. Yes, for example, if you have a company, if you have a branch, if you have a subsidiary in any other country, so what we need to do? Definitely, we need to use foreign exchange rates. We used to we used to rate use sorry we have to use rates of another currency basically. Yes, if we have to use another currency, then what it will be? There would be some fluctuation. So how we have to go for this fluctuation basically, how we can reduce those fluctuation, how we can reduce the losses, the impacts, obviously these fluctuation, these impacts would be discussed in financial instruments. But in IES 21, we will go for its accounting and reporting treatment. For example, if you have to pay to a company, if you have to pay a supplier in another currency, then how this transaction will be recorded. For example, you purchase something on 1st, 1st, 2019. And let's say your year end is 30th December, 2019. You have still, you have not paid your supplier. Then what you are going to do? Obviously there will be a different exchange rate at start of the year. There will be different exchange rates during the year there will be a different exchange rates at end of the year as well. So what you have to do? You have to apply relevant trades basically. So we have to use appropriate rate. Let's take another example. Let's say you are a MNC, multinational company. If you have a MNC, definitely it's quite possible there could be a lot of transactions. So do you think, is it possible to remember to apply different rates on different transactions? It could be, but practically it would be a huge, a complex transaction basically, how you are going to apply. When there will be an audit, either it is internal audit or external audit, so how it is going to be verified. Again, there will be huge complexity. So we will discuss what is the mechanism, what is the solution if you have multiple transactions then how you can use the rate. Either you have to use the rate of start of the year, you have to use your year end rate, you have to use your mid year rate or what rate do you have to use for your different transactions basically. We will discuss those rates basically. And what will be the impact, what will be the effect of those changes on your company. Next area is basically IAS 23 boring cost basically what is boring cost how this boring cost concept could be applied in our company basically let's say if we take a loan then how this loan would be recorded in your financial statements basically either this loan interest would be capitalized or this loan interest would be expensed out 
normally the interest amount is expensed out but it could be capitalized under some conditions so what are those conditions basically we will discuss in ies 23 then we have ies 24 related party distributors what are related party first of all you should understand what is related party either any one of your relatives your friend your colleague your directors key management personnel what do you mean by a related party do you think your subsidiary or an associate is a related party what do you think your subsidiary or an associate do you think are they related parties or not that is a little bit complex question obviously will be discussed in much area in detailed discussion then we have ies 26 accounting and reporting by retirement benefits plan basically again ias 26 is just basically with ias 19 you can see is 19 is at a level but is 26 is at d level basically so what does that mean it means we have to discuss we have to study is 19 in much detail in much detail but for is 26 that is at d level it means you just need an awareness like what is is 26 just basic score basic definition and nothing else examiner will not expect from any one of us to go for a detailed calculation detailed disclosure detailed discussion of is 26 no just awareness there is 27 separate financial statements like consolidation is 28 investments in associates and joint venture yes what is associate what is joint venture what are differences how many types of joint venture do we have how they are recorded then we have is 29 financial reporting in hyper inflationary economic specific so first of all you should understand what is hyper inflation what is hyperinflation normally we talk about inflation inflation means general increase in prices is called inflation but hyperinflation it means a huge level a very very high level of inflation is called hyperinflation so how we have to record the transactions according to hyperinflation basically let's say if we just take a very simple example on this date let's say one dollar is equal to 100 but let's say after one week one dollar is equal to i am just taking some hypothetical example this is called hyperinflation you can see the differences it means there is a very huge there is a very high level of inflation basically that is called as hyperinflation obviously there will be some company there that will be operating in a hyperinflation environment so what you need to do how you have to record those transactions for those companies those are operating in a hyperinflation environment basically that is a part of is 29 either it is at d level but you should understand hyperinflation concept how different indexes could be applied then we have is 32 financial instruments presentation for is 30 after is 32 we will discuss many other areas like we have ifrs 7 we have ifrs 9 ifrs 9 that is a detailed discussion but IFRS, ifrs 7 is for disclosures basically so we will be studying the different disclosures for financial instruments basically we have is 33 earning per share that is normally known as eps earning per share then we will talk about diluted earning per share basically 
Then we will study the impact of light issue, bonus issue, how your EPS, how your DEPS, diluted earning per share is going to be affected with your light issue, bonus issue, or any other transaction, basically. Then we have IS 34, interim financial reporting. What is interim financial reporting? First of all, you should understand what is the meaning of interim. Normally, people think like uh, after six months, let's say it is start of your year, that is your year end. So they assume that 30th June is your interim period. No, it could be your interim or it might not be. So what do you mean by interim? First of all, you should understand the word interim and then you should go for interim financial reporting. Then we have IS 36, impairment of assets. Yes, if any one of your asset is being impaired, then what you have to do? Again, this impairment concept will also be studied, will also be discussed in IAS 16, basically. IAS 16, normally it has a concept of revaluation. That is an increase in valuation of an asset, increase in value of an asset. Impairment is basically the opposite of revaluation. Impairment is basically reduction in value of an asset. So how you are going to study? We will discuss this impairment in IAS 16 as well. Let's say if your value will increase, then what you will do? If your value will decrease, then what you have to do? It is quite possible it might be increased, then it could be decreased. Again, it could be increased. Or first of all, it could be decreased and then it could be increased. So there could be different transactions. There could be a cycle in practical life. So what is the impairment of asset basically? We will discuss not only assets, but we will also discuss the impact of impairment on our CGU, that is cash generating unit, different groups of asset basically. Then we will talk about what is CGU. Then we have IS 37 provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets basically. Yes, what is the difference between provision, contingent liabilities and contingent assets basically. In this standard, we will also look at the financial statements of different companies how they go for different provision, how they go for different definition, different points of contingent liabilities, basically. How they are presented in your financial statements practically. Then we have IS 38 intangible assets. Earlier on, we were talking about tangible assets, basically, tangible. Tangible means anything that has physical existence that is called tangible assets. But IS 38 is intangible asset. So what is intangible? If something is intangible that do not have any physical existence, then how it could be recorded? How it could be measured? That is again, a very, very important question. Then we have IS 39 financial instruments, recognition, measurement, hedging, only note one. Then we have IS 40 investment property, yes. What is investment property? At the start of our session, we were just talking about. Then we have IES 41 agriculture. Again, what is agriculture? IES 41, basically. What do you mean by agriculture? What do you mean by different plants? What do you mean by different animals, basically? Yes. These are also classified according to IES 41 agriculture. Yes, there is a difference between plant and a dead plant, basically. Plant would be having a different treatment, but a dead plant or a dead animal would be having a different treatment, basically. So till here, we were just talking about IAS International Accounting Standards. Then we have some of the IFRSs, basically. IFRS mean International Financial Reporting Standard. First of all, we have IFRS 1, first time adoption, that is at C level. Then we have IFRS 2, share based payment. Yes, I told you earlier, share based payment is basically a type of benefit that we give to different employees, particularly to retain those employees, like key management personnel, like your, your director, CFO, C level person, or any other key person. Basically. 
Then we have IFRS 3 business combination like consolidation. We have IFRS 4 insurance contract. You can see IFRS 4 is at B level basically. So examiner will not expect detailed calculation or complex areas or complex definition. No, that's very simple transition. IFRS 5, non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operation. Two areas, you can see, held for sale and discontinued operation. Normally, people think if you have gone for held for sale, it means you have closed your operation. So it is it is the same thing. No. My dear, there are, there are huge differences between held for sale and discontinued operation. A lot of differences. Even in your financial statements, you have a lot of differences about the presentation. Then we have IFRS 6. IFRS 6 is basically about mineral mining. Again, that is at D level. I told you earlier, what do you mean by D level? Then we have IFRS 7 financial statements, but disclosures, qualitative and quantitative. So both type of disclosures would be discussed here. Then we have IFRS 8 operating segments yes what do you mean by a segment how you can differentiate between a segment or a branch what is a segment what is a branch what is the criteria of a segment what is the reporting treatment of a segment basically yes in last few years we have a complete question on our operating segment specifically the only reason is just to make sure that we should not ignore and we will not leave a single topic, either it is IFRS 8 or any other topic, because everything is very, very important. But unfortunately, most of the companies do not go for the disclosures of operating segments, basically. Yes, we will talk about what disclosures are there in IFRS 8 operating segment, which disclosures are normally given which disclosures are not given and what is the reason why companies do not provide disclosures of IFRS 8. If they do not provide disclosure, then do you think either it is a departure from IFRS or not? What will be the impact on their audit report basically? Either their report would be qualified or it will not be qualified. Then we have IFRS 9. Financial instruments, again, we will discuss in detail. We have IFRS 10, consolidated financial statements, IFRS 11, IFRS 12. So the IFRS 10, 11, 12, again, all of these are just like the family of consolidation in short words. So these are family of consolidation. You can see a group. Then we have IFRS 13, fair value measurement, yes. Normally, we use this concept that fair value. We have to use the fair value. Like, what is fair value? What is fair value? What is cost? What is historical cost? What is historical cost? What is revaluation? What is revalued amount? What is replacement value? What is replacement value? What is the residual value? So different types of values, different types of definition, different types of concept. You should be able to understand what are differences between these points and many other points, basically. How fair value is calculated? How fair value is measured, basically? Do you think, is there any instrument, any criteria of fair value measurement? What are disclosures of fair value measurement? Why I am focusing on fair value? Because there will be multiple transactions that will be that would be recorded according to either a cost, fair value, revalued amount, historical cost, replacement value, or any other value basically. So you should be able to understand what is the fair value, what is recognition criteria, what is the measurement criteria, what are different levels, what are the assumptions, either they are reasonable or they are not reasonable assumptions. Then we have IFRS 14 that is regulatory deferral accounts basically. What is the regulatory deferral account? That is at C level. It means not much complexity, not much discussion would be on this area. Then we have another important point that is IFRS 15. 
revenue from contract with customers basically yes that is revenue so that is a replacement of iasat so that is a revenue replacement is 18 was basically about revenue recognition obviously now is 18 will not be applied ifrs 15 would be applied complex level a very very important standard i revenue ifrs 15 will discuss about revenue it will also talk about the construction side construction mechanism because now is 18 is not applicable again IAS 11 is not applicable to. So instead of IAS 11, we will also study IFRS 15 in terms of construction, in terms of contracts, basically. Then we have leases, IFRS 60, what is lease? There was IAS 17, leases. So why there was need of IFRS 16? Do you think? IFRS 16 is better as compared to IS 17? If yes, then why? If no, then why? You have to discuss the reason why there was, why there is IFRS 16, why there is no IAS 17. What were the problems in IAS 17? What is something better in IFRS 15, IFRS 16 basically? Then we have IFRS 17 insurance, a very small level, C level, then we have some IFRSs for SME, small and medium size entities, basically. So all of these areas, all of these standards are basically part of our corporate reporting. So we will discuss all of these points. We will study all of these standards in our sessions, basically. As we can see, so we will divide all of these areas, these standards in two points. First of all, there are some basic standards. And then there are some advanced level standards, basically, complex standards, you can say. So what we will be going on, normally at this point, it's quite possible someone, someone from you, someone of you might remember the basics, like for IS-23, 24, IS 8, IS 10, someone might not be caught. So students at this point might be confused what they have to do. Either they have to revise their standards at their own, or we will provide them support. We will start from our first topic. So what we are going to do, we will cover our basic standards. We will also cover our advanced standards. Apart from these areas, we will also cover our past papers. And we will also cover our question bank, QB question bank here as well. So what we are going to do, we will be having some live session. Apart from some live session, we have recorded sessions here as well, basically. So we will share the recordings of those areas, those some standards, basically. And after you will watch the recording in the next session, we will discuss what are your queries, basically. What are your problems? What are your issues? So we will be discussing those problems, those issues, and then we will discuss the multiple different interactive questions. I will be solving some of the questions here in class. Someone from your side, any one of you, will be solving the question in live session here as well, basically. And all of these sessions would be recorded session here as well. So if any one of you who misses out, then definitely recording of that area will be shared to you after the class, basically. So you should not be worried either how you have to go for basic area, we will cover basic standards. Apart from basic standard, we will also go for advanced standards here as well. And all of these sessions would be recorded session and recordings would be shared with you. We will also cover our past papers. We will also cover our question bank. So in our first session, that was just an overview. Uh, what are your reporting areas in our next session? That is tomorrow. We will talk about our auditing area or what is included in our audit portion, basically. And then we will also talk about our strategy, how we are going to go for our strategy, basically how we will study basic standards, advanced standards, past paper, question bank, what we have to do, basically. So as I told you earlier that there are some different notes, let's say these are notes of intangible assets, 
you should be able to understand what is the different types, introduction, definition, scope. Normally we use the word copyright, patent and trademark. And we think all of them are same thing. They can be used in just like synonym. No, there is a difference between copyright, patent and trademark. What are the differences? How you have to study? What is trademark? What is brand? How brand is registered basically? So there are different points, complex points that you should be able to understand and differentiate, particularly at this advanced level. Because after qualifying this, either we will be in our industry or in firm or having our own business. So we will be facing these type of minor and technical issues. So we should be able to differentiate what are our concepts basically. So our aim is just not to pass the exam, but also deliver you some sort of knowledge so you can work out in your practical life. So these are some differences. Copyrights, patents, trademark. What do you think about Coca-Cola? Brand or trademark? What do you know about McDonald's? What do you know about I am loving it? What does this phenomenon mean? What do you mean by curved glass bottles? Either it's a brand or it's a trademark. If we move to another area, then we have IFRS 5, non current assets held for sale and discounted operation. Yes. What is abundant non current asset basically? What are disposal group? What is impairment? So do you think IS 36 IAS 36 has any relation with IFRS 5? Yes, there is a very close relation of IS 36 and IFRS 5 basically. What is that relation? That is impairment. Allocation for disposal groups basically. What is disposal group? What is disposal of an individual asset? What is disposal of group basically? What is impairment allocation? How this is allocated? Either we can charge the impairment or we cannot charge. If we cannot chart, then thank you very much. But if we can charge the impairment, then what is the mechanism? How we can charge the impairment? Basically? Again, this is a very, very important question. All of these questions will be answered in our sessions specifically. So this was basically our first slide session of corporate reporting. In our next session, we will talk about what is included in auditing, in our audit syllabus of corporate reporting, how we will cover, and then we will discuss our overall strategy about our notes, question bank, past paper, how we will cover them. So we will cover them all of these areas in our next session, basically. Thank you all of you for joining. If you have any question, please let me know. Otherwise, we will be having our next session for strategic business management. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to unmute all of you. And if you have any question, please let me know. And lastly, thank you very much for joining.